Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Tuesday, May the 11th, 2021 session in our about entrepreneurship and Asian high tech industries. And today I'm very happy that we can introduce the situation in South Korea. Uh, and to talk to us about what's happening with some recently big news from South Korea, namely the IPO of Coupon, uh, we have Mr. Eric Kim, who is a managing partner of Goodwater Capital. And Goodwater Capital is a consumer technology-focused venture capital firm that Eric co-founded in 2014. He previously was managing director of Maverick Capital, and he's been a founding executive of two technology companies, and he's also been a consultant with McKinsey. Uh, Eric has led early stage and growth stage investments into various mobile technology companies like Kakao, Zifitz, Coupang, and Upsite. He's uh, on the board of a number of companies, and Close to my heart, Eric is a classically trained cellist. He got his BA from Yale and was a member of the uh, Grammy-nominated Yale Cellos. Eric was also has an MBA from Stanford, and he serves on the advisory board of the Johns Hopkins Alliance for Science and Technology. Eric, before I turn the microphone over to you, I want to say a brief shout out. Thanks very much to Ms. Clara Yunjin Chang for introducing us. Clara is now the chief, uh, chief strategy officficer. You want to say science, chief strategy officer for Page. <laughs> That's correct, okay. Yunjin? Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> so welcome in from Korea and uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Eric, um, I think you've got some prepared remarks for us. Love to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, Professor Dasher. And it's an honor to be with everyone here today on the Zoom call. I wish we were in person uh, or had some element of at least in person. Um, and, I, and I look forward to hopefully uh, meeting some of you at some point, either virtually or uh, in real life. And I was, as I was thinking back on, on the pandemic, it's actually been, I'm based here in the Bay Area. Uh, this is this is home for us here in California, but it's now been over 18 months since I've been to Asia and Korea specifically. And this is a, uh, a country and a region more broadly that's not just very important to Goodwater's investing strategy. We're a global consumer tech investing platform, and I'll tell you more about that. But very important to me personally, uh, though I was born here in the United States, I was born in New York son of two immigrants that came in the early 70s to the US to live the American dream. Uh, something in my heart always had this desire to have a connection to, uh, for lack of a better term, my motherland. And uh, little did I know that despite growing up in St. Louis, Missouri, so the, 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 uh, I'm a Midwest kid at heart, um, uh, despite going to, to undergrad in the States and business school in the, in the States, uh, little did I know that that many years later, I would end up investing in uh, Cacao Talk, which many of you would know. Uh, now it's a $45 billion publicly traded company. I was their first institutional investor. I was on their board as an observer for five years until it went public. And little did I know that I'd also invest in a company called Coupon, which recently went public for $85 billion. And also I was on their board for six years. And so this this kid, um, you know, who grew up in, in you know pretty much as American as it gets in St. Louis, um, I want to tell you a little bit about my story and and why it's so near and dear to my heart uh, to have been able to have some impact on the Korea venture capital ecosystem and more globally why that has prepared us as a firm to be global investors, multicultural, and not just focused on what's going on in our backyard. And I think that's the most important thing to take away from this conversation, and I welcome this to be really a conversation and a discourse about global investing and global cultures and how we can be just conduits for inf information exchange and cultural exchange itself, that this kid uh, could end up investing in a couple of companies that combined would be well over, well north of $100 billion of net new market cap creation, tens of thousands of, dollars, uh, tens of, thousands of new jobs created in an economy um, uh, that you know my, my parents almost can't believe uh, it, 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 when they think about it. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about that today. 
Um, and it's just an honor to be with you all. So, so thank you again. Let me, let me share my screen and I'll go through a few kind of organized slides, if you will, but I would invite you all to ask questions. Professor Dasher or Kimberly, please ask about questions as well. Um, and, and anyone in the audience, really, I'm an open book. So uh, again, just appreciate uh, the time to be with you today. Um, uh, the, you know, the title today is Global Investing in Lessons uh, from Coupon, Lessons That I Learned from being on the, the board for six years. I have to give the, the public caveat, this is not in any way, shape or form meant to be investment advice. Uh, I am not an insider or a key stakeholder of the company. Uh, as of today, I've been off the board for several years at this point, um, but hopefully uh, you know, the information that I am using, which is all available in the public realm itself uh, through this lens is helpful for you all to understand another culture and another cult, another company that has reached just astronomical scale itself, um, itself. And I'll get to why we call this why Coupon is not the Amazon of South Korea in a little bit here. Here's the rough agenda. Well, I'll go over our firm a bit uh, quickly. Uh, just talk about three key lessons learned from Coupon itself. Talk about global investing itself, and, and, and certainly would love to do some Q and A. And, and to get to know folks, um, please feel free to reach out over LinkedIn. I would love to collect, connect with folks as well during the course of this call too. Um, in 2014, we, uh, my co-founder and myself, uh, we came together. We were both at very large investment firms. And we decided to come together specifically to create a firm that was mission first in our approach. And our mission at Goodwater itself is to empower exceptional entrepreneurs who are changing the world through consumer technology. Every single one of these words is very intentionally uh, chosen. The, the word about empower, exceptional, changing the world and consumer technology itself. Both my co-founder Chiwa Chien and myself had these amazing experiences, sometimes out of tragedy, that really showed the power of consumer technology itself. I'll never forget the moments uh, when September 11, 2001 happened. I was a senior at Yale University walking to class I believe it was a Korean language class actually. And we saw the news and people didn't think it was real at first, but being at an East Coast school, it very much hit home to a number of us. We, everyone had a family member or fellow ex coworker or coworker, someone that was impacted by what happened at 9-11, particularly in New York City, obviously DC was quite tragic as well. And what we did on campus was to mobilize a group called the Musical Cure at Yale. This is a non, this is kind of a nonprofit or volunteer group that I helped organize a year earlier where we would go to soup kitchens, we would go to, to cancer wards, we'd go to the hospital, we would go to areas where people couldn't come to see, listen to the music and we would bring the music to other people. And it was a, it was a way of healing. That's why we were called the Musical Cure at Yale. And when 9-11 happened, we said, hey, we're not billionaires. We don't have a lot of resources, but we wanna bring the community together and we decided to, to have a series of benefit concerts on campus in, uh, post the, the tragic events to bring the community together to raise some money to, to provide to the 100 neediest cases coming out of the 9-11 tragedy uh, and, and the attacks uh, in New York City itself. The way we got the word out was some of the earliest forms of consumer technology. It was through AOL chat. It was through ICQ Messenger. It was through message boards in the internets at the time. And this showed me the power that you could literally change a small community and have impact on people's lives using digital technology that then could have a ripple effect, hopefully by people not just coming to that concert, but being able to commune together post-tragedy and support one another itself. And to this day, as we fast forward today, when we think about investing in technologies, my co-founder and myself, the other partners of Goodwater, we've invested in now over 17 quote unquote unicorns, if you will. Companies like Facebook, like Twitter, like what you know as TikTok today, Spotify, Coupon, Cacao. These are companies we almost take for granted that are part of our everyday lives itself. But at its core, these companies actually change lives. They change our perspectives. They connect one another. So that back in 2001, post 9-11 tragic events, people were actually able to commune together and do something that was good for the community, that was good for one another, and frankly, good for ourselves and our healing. 
this is our mission, is to empower exceptional entrepreneurs who are changing the world, the consumer technology itself. When we look at every single investment that we make, is it going to better society and the world in some way, shape, or form? That's why we're called good water itself. Water is very similar to capital and technology. Capital and technology can be used for great things and sometimes for not so great things, for nefarious things as well. We're not trying to be moralistic about it, but in the same way, water is the source of life for every single living organism in the world, but the lack of water or too much water itself can lead to death and destruction. We want to be the good water in the ecosystem. And I, I spending extra time on this because it is actually important in terms of how we think about global investing, our participation in the Korean startup ecosystem as well, also investing in companies like Coupang and Cacao, which have changed the entire economic landscape of a country itself. These are our core values around integrity, humility, quality, service, transparency, and we added a sixth just, uh, value of justice last year amidst the pandemic of COVID-19 itself and also the increasing pandemic of racism that we experienced in this country itself. And so this, these are the lenses through which we evaluate our investments. And again, it's not so that we're saying things are black and white and we're gonna only invest in what we deem morally, quote unquote, good companies. No, we want to apply these values in any situation, quote unquote, good or bad, but particularly in the messy middle when decisions are tough, and then having a values-oriented framework actually is really important. So that our portfolio companies, the employees of those companies and the constituents and the shareholders know that we are struggling with these values in mind to make the best decisions. And frankly, it's not just about profits or short-term cash flow itself, but how can we lift our heads up high and say, we actually live by these values and the decisions we made. And again, there's no quote unquote right answer or good, and, or good, good or bad. It's a process and it's a journey. And these are the values that we take with us as we go about it. Consumer technology itself requires a very focused mission and set of values because it is the most important and most powerful force in the world. If you look at seven of the eight largest companies in the world, they're consumer tech companies. Companies like Amazon, Facebook, Google, Apple, Microsoft, which started with the consumer applications, Word, remember the clip uh, guy that would give you advice along the way, um, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, Tesla as well. These are incredibly powerful companies themselves that shape cultures, shape lives. And we, we are intentionally saying we're gonna bring our mission and our values as we invest in these companies themselves. These are massive industries that are just getting started. And so you see trillion dollar plus companies like Google, close to trillion dollar companies like Facebook being born out of the advertising industry of $1 trillion. That's about 30% penetrated. That's on the upper right-hand part of your, your screen there. But there's a, a huge, enormous other industries like financial services, education, healthcare, which when we look at the whole of that, it's 50 times larger than advertising in and of itself. So the tailwinds and the market opportunity by focusing on just consumer tech, which is all we do, do, we don't do enterprise SaaS, we don't do biotech, we don't do clean tech or anything else. We just do consumer internet itself. We're the consumer internet experts, so to speak, is because we see a $50 trillion plus opportunity by focusing on companies that acquire users, they engage them, they retain in them, and they monetize them over time. And we want companies to do that with a specific mission of helping the world and doing it with a strong set of values as well. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this slide fairly quickly. Uh, you've heard my, my, my background uh, and a, a great shout out to uh, my partner, Chi Hua Qian, also a Stanford alumnus. We met at Stanford Business School in 2005. That's where the partnership started itself back then. Uh, so we, we've been long friend, time friends in the making and uh, have come together to, to create this firm. And I think it's it's fairly rare to have uh, partners with experience, but also uh, what I see in my partner and hopefully myself as well is a vision around how we can do things better within the venture capital ecosystem, both, both locally here in Silicon Valley, but also globally as well. Um, today, our portfolio is has, has grown immensely. 
over $100 billion of fintech gross payment volume flows through the companies in our, in our portfolio today. In education, over 36 million users. In healthcare, over 45 million lives are under care. In social, over 210 million monthly active users as well. And so this has been a really, really interesting dynamic as we think about stewardship and these companies that are within our portfolio. Again, all the more important that we have a clear mission and focus around values so that we think about, hey, we've got a responsibility to steward what's going through our portfolio companies in a good way itself. Uh, we're a little bit over $2 billion in AUM. At this point, we've made over 50 investments globally, uh, 17 unicorns, a uh, team of 35, 34 folks um, on the team, all based here in Silicon Valley. At this point, a couple uh, on, in other states along the West Coast or regions too. Uh, top fifth percentile venture returns, and we were founded in 2014 itself. So we've been a fairly rapidly growing venture capital firm, I would say, to have gone to multi-billion, a couple billion at scale in AUM itself. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the lessons learned that have, have gotten us there. But I would say that uh, being global is a really, really important part of the story. We've invested in now over 12 countries around the world. Here is a uh, uh, an example of some of the companies in North America, in Europe, in Asia, uh, within Asia, e within East Asia, East Asia, so Korea, Japan, and then Southeast Asia, Vietnam. We've made a few investments, Indonesia as well. And we think um, those markets will continue to be uh, really important areas for us to invest in as well. So uh, by no means are we just a Korea-focused investor, but um, I would be remiss to say if, if, if you know, it wasn't really an important part of our story, uh, both in my heritage as a Korean American, but also the investment activities and what we've learned from the Korean markets, and not only bring our learning from Silicon Valley to South Korea, but also what we've been able to gain. We've, 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 we've gotten so much more than we've put in, frankly, in terms of our learnings from what we've learned in the South Korea ecosystem and, and the, 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 the high tech market there. And these are the, some of the two companies, kind of marquee companies um, that I had invested in and served on the boards of, as I mentioned, Kakao Talk uh, since the Series A and Coupon since the Series B. Uh, this was at one of the earlier headquarters at Kakao Talk, the picture on the left, and then uh, the CEO of uh, Coupon Bomb and myself as well here on the right. Um, but, but let's talk about a few of the key lessons learned uh, from, from Coupon specifically. Again, this is all... Um, information you could find in the S1, it's, 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 it's out there. We've just synthesized it a bit and make it a bit consumable and have to, happy to tell some anecdotes around it as well that might help uh, provide pers some perspectives. Um, and, and, uh, and I think the first lesson is, you know, don't under underest underestimate South Korea. Don't underestimate South Korea. And I would say this is something that we see time and time again uh, from folks outside of South Korea and, and oftentimes from entrepreneurs uh, even within South Korea as well. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But South Korea itself is a massive market. It is the 12th largest economy in the world, $1.6 trillion in size. It's got 130 or $160 billion plus e-commerce market itself. The retail market is over 500 billion itself. It has one of the highest GDPs per capita, about 36,000 or $33,000 per person in, in, in the country of South Korea, 50 million strong itself. And it has some of the highest smartphone penetration rates in the world. It has, actually has the highest megabyte, average megabytes per second of any country in the world. I think it's 128 megabytes per second um, is the average connection in South Korea. And so you combine that plus the nuance that it's actually one of the most dense and urban countries in the world. The, on the left here, you see the top 10 cities in the United States. So you, you all know these cities, New York, 8.6 million, Los Angeles, 4 million, Chicago, 2.7 million, Houston, 2.3 million. And then look at the right. In South Korea, you have Seoul, a city of population of 9.9 .9 million, Busan, a city with a population of 3.5 million, Incheon, a city with a population of 2.9 million, bigger than Chicago. Tegu, bigger than Houston, 2.5 million. Tejun, just around the same size as Philadelphia of 1.5 million. And the list goes on and on and on, right? This juxtaposition of major US cities 
with major South Korea cities, I think puts into perspective of why you can build a massive business in South Korea as well. It's a population the size of 50 million people in a landmass the size of Indiana itself. So if you told me on the left-hand side, these top 10 cities in the United States all existed in Indiana, I would tell you, you are crazy. I've been to Indiana and that is a very, very hot place for all these cities to exist in. That's a lot of air conditioning. I used to spend my summers in Bloomington, Indiana, playing the cello at Indiana University uh, there. But if I were to say now, look at the cities on the right, 10 of these cities exist with populations of 9.9 million, 3.5 million, 2.9 million in South Korea. I think that in and of itself will be part of a very important pillar in understanding why a company like Coupang or Kakao or Uwa Brothers or Toss Securities, all these multi-billion dollar companies and startups have emerged because of the density coupled with the smartphone penetration rate that you see on the right, coupled with the economic prosperity that the company uh, that the country has enjoyed over the years being a 1.6 trillion dollar uh, uh, size economy at the, at this point take all that into consideration we cannot underestimate a, a, com a country like south korea itself and and despite oftentimes china getting the headlines or japan or maybe even southeast asia with the immense growth there a country like south korea cannot be overlooked and entrepreneurs also can start to think about, I can build a really, really big business focusing on this country itself. Obviously it's very competitive. You're running into other folks given the density and people are pursuing similar ideas. When Coupang launched itself, it was the 28th launch site focused on social commerce at the time in 2010 itself. So very, very competitive and now it's emerged as a leader and we'll talk about why. But first and for foremost, what I would say is that the team and management and the board early on at Coupang never underestimated how big of a business you could build in South Korea alone. And we'll fast forward later on about why Coupang is not the Amazon of Korea, the same way you would not say, with all due respect to the management and shareholders of United Air Airlines or American Airlines, you would not say that uh, Cathay Pacific is the United Airlines of Hong Kong or Asia. You would not say that ANA is the Southwest of Japan itself. And we'll talk about just the difference in, in customer service and the service standards and the innovation that these companies have created. And similarly, what Coupon has done with an e-commerce to set a, a new bar for, uh, in, my, in my humble opinion, for e-commerce and, and customer satisfaction and, and, and making the customer first itself. But first and foremost, you cannot underestimate South Korea in and of itself, and, and, and then you can go from there. The second is build a flywheel. If you build a business, what Coupon did really, really well is build a flywheel. So what is a flywheel? Right. A flywheel is something that at the beginning is very heavy. It's hard to move. It's hard to mobilize. You've got to really push hard to get a flywheel going. But once a flywheel gets spinning, it moves faster and faster and faster. And it utilizes its self momentum to start to continue to spin itself. And it gets better over time and moves even faster and gets bigger, better, and with scale too. In Coupon, it's very similar. Their flywheel is what is represented here in this picture. And I'll attempt to kind of explain it, but it becomes very circular very quickly. But let me start with some of the key elements of selection, lower prices itself. When you have products that are lower priced and have greater selection, you have a better customer experience on the right-hand side of this flywheel. That better, better experience leads to more customers. And the more customers on the platform, the more sellers that want to come and sell on the platform. That leads to then better selection, lower prices, and more services. That in turn leads to more scale, which leads to better pricing for those services and greater accessibility that then leads to a better customer experience, again, for more customers, for more sellers to come on board. Coupon had to build each of these pieces. They had to build software and services for sellers. They had to build a customer facing website. They had to build logistics to, 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 to stitch all this together so that eventually now you have some of the fastest delivery in the world happening in South Korea because of Coupon itself. But with that customer delight, more customers come in, 
more sellers come in, better pricing power, more selection, more, more pricing power, uh, better, better pricing, more customers. It goes on and on and on and on. When you build a great business, you build anything in your life, think about building flywheels itself. I talked to someone, they even thought about how do I build a flywheel with, uh, with, with my family itself. And so I'm waiting for uh, his answer because I'm going to apply it to, to raising my three boys itself here. But with scale, how do we get better? How do we manage these things? And, 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 and how do we get flywheel effects uh, themselves? And, and I think that's really, really important. Because when you think strategically about it, and it's not just about a one-off, how do I get one-off quick wins? How do we, instead, how do you think about the long-term itself? These kind of results happen. And so this is, again, just the surveys that we had done at the Korean consumer. And we asked them, which online shopping platform is the most convenient to use in South Korea? And 59% of folks, 59%, the second you know, the highest rated a company was 11th Street, so a huge margin of, uh, of, uh, of, of, um, of winning, I guess, uh, by coupon um, to this question uh, because they had built a flywheel that as they got bigger, they got better for the end consumer itself. Uh, so which online shopping platform has the best price? Coupon, 59% as well. Again, so it, it's, it's this kind of, when you build something strategic and you, you, you do the proper investment, you can actually have these kind of results with the end consumer as well. Um, similarly, how often do you shop? For a lot of consumers, it's at least daily, 18%, uh, 29% a few times per week. And so if you add up, the vast majority of folks are shopping several times on a week or a monthly basis. And what's really interesting is that if you look at the dotted lines of the chart on the right, Again, this data is coming from coupons S1, as well as publicly available information for other websites or other web services, compared to even an Amazon, which is the yellow line, yellow line, and an eBay, which is the red line at the bottom, and a Walmart, which is the blue line in the middle, the dotted lines of coupons cohorts from 2016 or the customers that were started in 2017, they shopped more over time their increased retention dollar rate purchasing rate increased over time at a greater rate that of Amazon or Walmart, which are incredibly sticky services that we know well here in the United States. Right? Once you use Amazon, you tend to think, oh, this is great. What else can I get delivered to me in two days or so? Amazon Prime. And so, so Eric? Yep. Eric, real quick question. Uh, we've got a number of questions coming in, most of which I want to let you do your overview first. But since you've got the comparison with Amazon up there, uh, why do you think Amazon did not do well in Korea? This question's from Helen. Yeah, I, I don't think Amazon has ever tried to launch a consumer-facing uh, uh, property that I'm aware of. I believe they have AWS uh, to serve enterprise clients itself. Uh, but Amazon itself hasn't prioritized or decided strategically um, um, uh, as far as I know, to not enter the South Korea market at this point. Um, my guess is it's probably not, it's probably due in no small part to, to the fact that Coupon has created such dominance uh, in the country and has this kind of lead itself in brand power. And for, for Amazon to try to disrupt that would take in considerable investment. Um, and, and, and I think we'll get to it a little bit later uh, but what Coupon is doing on a product perspective, what in terms of the services, uh, I'll, I'll give you a preview of it. One example is something they call Dawn Delivery. So uh, items you, you order by midnight the day before will get to you by dawn or 6 or 7 a.m. the next morning. Wow. We, we don't have that with Amazon today. Um, and so uh, if Amazon wanted to enter that, again, this is my personal speculation. I don't have any the edge in terms of information on it, um, they would have to create services that they haven't created here in the United States themselves. Uh, and so I, I think that's um, probably why uh, they haven't entered is my guess, uh, but I obviously don't know fully. Is now a good time to ask about your kind of comparison between uh, Coupang and say uh, Alibaba, especially Taobao? And Alibaba, do you think there was a real different strategy? Yeah, this I question think, came both from Stephen and also from Helen. Yeah, I think there's a there's a difference both in terms of uh, 
just business model itself with Alibaba by having a more of an open marketplace uh, versus Coupang being more integrated, vertically integrated with the suppliers, everything going through its own warehouse itself versus being uh, drop shipped uh, from third parties itself. And so <clears throat> I think in, in that regard, um, uh, uh, it, you know, uh, Coupang might be more similar to like a JD.com in, in China versus an Alibaba. Uh, in terms of its consumer-facing assets and 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 the vertical integration it has itself, um, uh, I think that in any given market, there is a, a question about whether you should be vertically integrated or or whether you have more uh, marketplace opportunities within it. You've seen even here in the United States that Amazon also also offers third-party market you know uh, sellers on its platform. Coupon now also offers that as well, and I think you know, it's a natural evolution. But I think one of the key things is that you, what Coupon has done is we'll talk about a little bit later is they've created now a hundred warehouses that are within the top 30 cities, uh, very close proximity to the top 30 cities in, in, in South Korea itself. And they built out an infrastructure that allows it to have uh, close proximity and, and items and goods to go through their, their infrastructure, both physically and, and their, uh, their digital infrastructure as well. So I think in that regard, it is different. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it's it's got this uh, customer focus that I think is uh, a little bit different in, in South Korea. Okay, that's great. Uh, you know, we've got some other good questions, but why don't I let you go on through your prepared remarks a little bit more first? Great. Thanks great. for stopping. Yeah, and 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 we can get to those fairly quickly here because I think um, uh, these slides will will uh, we're, we're we're approaching at the end. I think. You know the, the third kind of key key area of learning, if you will, or or um, uh, that that I think is really important, is to, is to be bold and and set stretch goals themselves. And so, uh, you know, when it was a little startup, started in two thousand ten, and uh, you know, uh, and, you know, not the first to market, not the biggest by any means, uh, to the management team and, and the founders, to Bomb's credit. They, they always thought really, really big and set these amazing stretch goals. And so if you think about 70% of the population, this is straight from this one, lives within seven miles of a coupon logistics center. And, and, and to get there, I would encourage everyone to, to read this new book about Amazon called Working Backwards. And, and so maybe there is some similarity in that regard, but think about the end vision and what is the ideal state and then work backwards from there. This was presumably part of the vision that would they wanted to fulfill that most of the population in South Korea would be so close to logistics center that they would, they would be able to do things like the next day dawn delivery. They would be able to do thing do things like rocket delivery, where a lot of goods are available next day dawn and same day delivery, which I explained earlier, effortless returns, deliveries without packaging. I wish I had this in the U.S. The amount of cardboard that gets thrown away in our household or recycled, it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's actually, uh, you know, I hope that it's all done in an environmental safe way, but the, the packaging itself, I wish we could get a lot of deliveries without packaging. So you could line up times and say, hey, I'm here, just give me the stuff that, that we need. Uh, they have that in South Korea. Um, uh, vast selection of millions of items as well. The last order by midnight, those items, these are, these are stretch goals where you could think about reimagine the customer experience and don't let the supply chain or infrastructure dictate what you can do for consumers, but instead think about what would be ideal for you and work backwards from there itself. And so again, the third kind of point, I think that is remarkable and, and it will be a little bit um, uh, almost mind blowing when you go to a country like South Korea now is when you have an e-commerce experience there, it's almost like you can't go back. So when you fly a Cathay Pacific or some other kind of international airline and you come back and you're like, whoa, there's a huge difference. Or you, you stay at a nice accommodation in, in, a, in a, a city like Seoul or Hong Kong or Tokyo and you come back uh, to the States, it is a world of difference and I would say the same because they started with reimagining what could that consumer experience be like and work backwards to make it happen itself. Uh, and, and as a result, 
they've created massive market share gains in the past year, uh, year on year. Uh, they became the leader with 25% market share from a dollar's perspective, I believe, uh, in e-commerce itself. And I think it's just a testimony to, to, to some of these lessons learned, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, over the years. Um, and so that's really kind of, uh, Professor Dasher, my prepared remarks and slides. Um, and, okay. and would love to ask, you know, answer any questions at this time as well. These are great. I've got the first few that I've, I kind of want to put into sort of an order. Um, so another kind of comparison with say, Alibaba would be the kind of competition dynamics in the country. Uh, so JDD is really threatening coupon and so forth. Your last slide before the Q&A slide that showed the market share uh, shows G Market and some of the others that have pretty significant market shares too. Is um, coupon feeling pressure? Yeah, so it's interesting because uh, the, the chart on the one that I showed showed how they went from uh, 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 becoming going from 18% to 25%, which squarely made them the largest e-commerce player within the course of a year. And that took many years because companies like G-Market had been in place. I believe G-Market went public in 2007 or 2009 and was acquired by eBay for a couple of billion dollars. And it was one of eBay's largest XUS markets in the world itself. And so they had brought this marketplace model <clears throat> to South Korea or they had, they had acquired it and made it part of their marketplace family of companies, if you will. And over time, Coupon just has apparently just taken more and more market share away from, from G Market. And I believe uh, my understanding from news reports is that it's it's being sold or has been put on the <coughs> auction uh, path from, from eBay as well. And so I think that is some of the disruptive power, even within e-commerce, it's not only taking market share away from uh, traditional retail, I would assume, but also from, from eBay and other uh, e-marketers or e-tailers, e if you will. And so it, from that regard, I think um, there is certainly intense local competition. Uh, it's what drives <clears throat> product innovation itself. So having a competitive market is, is really, really good. I, I, you know, in the U.S., for example, um, I can't really think of who else I would go to for e-commerce goods. I don't know if you all can, but uh, the fact that in South Korea, there might be alternatives to go to drives a company like Coupon, I would imagine, to be even stronger and have even greater products. If Amazon had someone hot on their heels, uh, then uh, maybe we would have same day or next day delivery at this point in the US too. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a, a expert by those uh, elements, but um, th th that seems to be uh, an interesting dynamic that it's both, both, you know, if you're, you're at coupon, maybe it's, you know, you've got competition and so it drives you then to produce even greater products itself. I'm not saying that Amazon doesn't face competition, but, um, uh, in the same, in some ways, I do wonder that if, you know, because of the lack of competition, if, if that has actually slowed some innovation on the consumer front, um, uh, if you look at coupon as a comparison itself. Yeah, okay. So uh, kind of next question in that regard is Korea being a 50 million person economy, whereas the US 300 million, and of course, coupon is not that big outside Korea yet. Um, is there at some point will coupons start to show up on the radar of antitrust people in Korea? And conversely, what happened because of coupon to mom and pop retail stores? You know, the kind of things that, you know, you can go shopping in lots of parts of Seoul for. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, uh, the, 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 the antitrust side, I haven't thought about that, but I, I would imagine that given that there's so much other competition in Korea and, they, and they're taking market share away, it, it seems to, um, uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't studied the topic itself uh, closely enough to have a, a cogent answer on it, but 
uh, based on that market share, market share data, it seems like it's a fairly <clears throat> competitive uh, market still in and of itself, but um, but coupons certainly by the data on is- On the e-commerce ahead. side, but, yeah. but you know, mom and pop retail has an awful lot of people who are voters, they vote, right? Right, and right. so I'm surprised that politics is not kind of protecting them more. Yeah, I, th- I think there's uh, again. Uh, well, I think I think uh, part of the discourse around this would also need to include, uh, you know, the tens of thousands of employees. I think Coupang is now the second largest creator of jobs on an annual basis in the South Korean economy itself, and so. They employ, they have the largest fleet of drivers, I think 15,000 directly employed drivers as well that makes up their logistics network, as an example, the 25 million square feet of warehouse space itself. So it's creating an entire uh, generation of of economic opportunity for people in South Korea, which has, you know, it, it taking what of my, what I know more colloquially, frankly, and uh, from from uh, uh, my experience with South Korea, it is dominated by a lot of the conglomerates or chebols that we know of. And so, uh, traditionally, you know, folks graduating from college would say, "Hey, well, where are you going to work? Samsung or LG, right?" Yeah, and, right. And, and so <laughs> you have your choice. <laughs> you're right. And, and now that you have companies like Kakao, like Coupon helping to create this creator economy, innovation, data science, product management, technology, engineering, uh, I think is, is really uh, empowering for Korea both locally and also as Korea thinks about its place in the global marketplace as well and being a leader from, from a technology perspective. I think, Professor Dasher, your point around, around mom and pop starts uh, shops uh, is an important one as well. Um, I think that uh, it, it is, is, you know, SMEs are a really important part of every economy out there. Uh, in South Korea as well, I think there are obviously segments of the economy where there is a role for mom and pop shops, if you will, for, for the, the local uh, grocery store or the corner store, or that's part of neighborhoods, it's part of the fabric uh, of neighborhoods. Uh, you know, I think that's really, really important. I, I would you know, this is where I would have to draw more on my kind of U.S. experiences in, in some ways that if you think about how retail has evolved over time, I think it has shifted where uh, where the goods and services that you can get in a local, very local setting versus in an e-commerce setting, they start to bifurcate even more. And, and I think that is where you can also find ways for mom and pop shops to continue to have a place within the economy, as well as e-commerce companies being able to provide even better services for the end consumer too. And so it's a, it's a, it's a balance. I don't, I don't have all the answers to it. And I think if we look at it through the lens of the consumer, they have a need for both the local corner store as well as e-commerce in their lives as well. Okay. That's a, that's a, you know, that's the economy will tell, right? Right. Um, I have several questions about Coupang and what's next for them. Are they going to expand? Will they internationalize? And I think I want to give a little bit of my own perspective in this. So for a while in the early 2000s, Korean startup companies were just really going gangbusters. And they didn't really internationalize. And there was kind of a feeling, I think, inside Korea that um, they lost out because they didn't. I'm thinking companies like Daum. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if Coupon will be able to carry what they've got to these other markets that are not so intensely urban. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. Um... This is only one part of the puzzle, but I, I think that what is different now versus even 10, 15 years ago, say, is that like with a company like Daum, um, is that the ability for foreign investor and capital to come in to be not just capital, but also helpful and strategic to build bridges has greatly changed over the years itself. And so I would like to think that in, in some small way uh, that 
uh, that uh, venture firms like Goodwater, venture firms like Altos Ventures, uh, for example, have been able to create bridges for entrepreneurs, not just through capital, but also strategic, strategic connections so that this idea of going global and being ex exporting uh, not just TVs and cars from South Korea, but also digital content, digital apps, and, and technology itself can become a reality over time. Now, I think doing that for the sake of just doing it makes no sense, right? That the, I think there are a lot of programs that say, we are going to help create the first multinational uh, Korean company in tech, uh, for example, uh, but there has to be real authentic product market fit that, that allows for that to happen. And so, uh, I don't know if Coupang's plans, for example, about if they're going to go to other markets, you know, e-tailing or retailing is a very local game in each country itself. It, it requires a lot of local expertise and it requires physical operations as well. Uh, I think that companies that have a, a uh, uh, almost a pure digital offering have a really, really interesting opportunity to go global because you can launch an app from anywhere in the world now. With a click of a button, you can launch your app to 200 countries through the App Store itself. And so another portfolio company uh, uh, of ours is called Dangan Market or Carrot. And they launched, it's a the, one of the fastest growing uh, uh, community, mar community marketplaces. Uh, think, think of it as offer up meets next door, if you will, uh, in South Korea. And so uh, they've been one of the fastest growing social apps uh, in South Korea in history. Um, and they've also extended their services uh, utilizing their technology and their data science to enter the UK market, uh, enter New York as well. And so that doesn't require physical local operations to do that. It requires product ingenuity and technology and data science and, and engineering to do that. And so I think that will be a really interesting trend to see South Korean companies export their digital companies or digital apps into other countries as well. Um, Coupon, I don't, I don't know. There's such a big local e-commerce market. Uh, when Coupon extended into grocery and restaurant delivery as well, it tripled its, its TAM, I believe, in South Korea alone. And so there's, they can literally 40 to 50X their revenues. I believe they did 12 billion or so uh, net revenue last year. So there's a huge market opportunity ahead of them in, in the South Korean market itself still. Okay. Uh, so kind of cutting to the point, when we were talking about titles before we, you know, before today, yeah. You kind of suggested the title of why Coupon is not the Amazon of South Korea. Uh, yeah. Could you clarify what you were thinking about that? <laughs> yeah, I think that was me trying to be a little bit too clever <laughs> sometimes, but <laughs> um, it's certainly a bit, bit tongue in cheek. Um, uh, and part of it, I was getting so sick of being asked, <laughs> is, is Coupon the, is the, the, yeah. you know, the Amazon of South Korea? And, 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 I, and, I, and I really had to, you know, yeah, I just kind of had to think and be like, I, I, I guess so. If you think about it, that Amazon is an e-commerce company and Coupon is also an e-commerce company. So that's true. And, and, um, and, you know, their maniacal focus on the customer uh, maybe may be, you know, be similar <clears throat> between the two. But in, in many ways, uh, you couldn't take the Amazon product and bring it to Korea. You couldn't take the, you couldn't take the Korea product, you know, the coupon product, product and bring it to the U.S. Um, and so uh, it, it, they're, they're very, very different. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I had to kind of tongue in cheek uh, talk about the airlines is just an example because I think for a lot of us who have traveled to uh, a country uh, like China or uh, South Korea or Japan, Taiwan, um, you're kind of like wowed and you're amazed uh, uh, and, and, and by that experience, you enter a department store in Tokyo or Seoul as an example, and you have two people you know, that, that are, are kind of right there to serve you at any given time. Uh, it, it's just a very, very different experience. And so I, I, I kind of had to reflect on that. Um, again, I grew up in, you know, primarily in 
middle of America, St. Louis, Missouri, right? The Galleria department store was where people went to shop <laughs> with kiosk and big parking garages and all that stuff, right? Uh, but even more so, I can understand the contrast and the difference when I then visited and spent significant time uh, in the home country of my parents, how different it was in many ways. But because I had that experience of being born and raised here, I could appreciate it even more so. Like I could appreciate the beauty of that because I had spent, you know, most of my time being raised here in the U.S., but then to be able to go and reflect that back and think about, okay, how can we bring, uh, you know, our learnings from, from here in Silicon Valley or the States as well. And now increasingly, we take these learnings. And I'm sure the Amazon team is now really paying a lot of attention to, oh, wow, how did they do that? How did they create Dawn delivery? How did they create package list delivery itself? Well, this is why we couldn't do it here in the States or, you know, X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, too big, too, too much of a landmass to cover. Uh, we, we don't have enough uh, warehousing space, um, all these elements. But I think, I think the world is watching now. I think the world is seeing something that hasn't been created anywhere else in the world and thinking about, okay, how can we apply that to, to where we are locally too? Okay. We had a couple of questions about sort of your experience with coupon. And so when you were first looking at coupon, um, how would you compare Bone Kim, the founder of coupon with say kind of a successful silicon Valley entrepreneur? Were there any differences in personality or any differences in style? What, what, how would you make that comparison? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I think it's a very, very unique set of experiences growing up in South Korea, coming to the to the States for, for education, going to Harvard for undergrad, working at BCG Consulting, having done a couple of startups, went to HBS, Harvard Business School, and then dropped out his first year to start Coupang itself and go back to South Korea. Part of a broader trend of, uh, of folks who have gone back to um, countries like China or Korea or Southeast Asia to start companies leveraging their multicultural experiences abroad. And so I think in that regard, Bomb is very unique because he can speak Korean fluently, English fluently, uh, I'm sure he could win, you know, multiple uh, speech contests in both countries uh, in terms of his eloquence and his ability to articulate vision. Um, and so in that regard, it's, it's really, really impressive what Baum has built uh, at Coupon. And, um, and I often get the question like, you know, is that surprising or, um, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of this um, an, an anomaly in, in some ways. And I also have to think about that a little bit, to be honest, because I, I often wonder like, why is that astonishing for folks? Uh, and, and I think in some ways it's because we, ha we haven't had a chance to shine the light on some of the ingenuity and entrepreneurship. And so programs like this class that is being made available to anyone who wants to register, I think it's incredible because I don't want it to be kind of like this surprise, like, oh, this Korean entrepreneur created this big company. And, and, and I'm like, well, have you heard of Samsung before? You know, <laughs> have you heard of um, uh, Kia or, or Hyundai? Hyundai, you know? yeah. And, and, um, and, and I think it's fantastic that we have people in investment in entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley on Wall Street, really paying attention to the region because it's, it's important that uh, we don't underestimate a country like South Korea nor its entre entrepreneurial capabilities as well. And that uh, I'm, I'm so encouraged that an institution like Stanford can leverage its platform and brand name to bring light to a region, not out of saying, hey, how, we're going to suddenly become, you know, the, the, the godsend to this, these countries or something like that. But instead, it's, it's about, hey, let us highlight what's happening in an innovative way that people from all around the world can learn from, including ourselves. 
here at Stanford. I think this is like a really important change in perspectives or cultural attitudes that I think is, is the work that I'm probably most proud of coming out of backing companies like Kakao and Coupon. And of course, if these were tiny companies, no one would be listening to this talk or, or paying any attention. So, so those companies have so to prove it. Let me, let me kind of interrupt the, the flow because that you're raising a really important point. As a venture capital investor who is working from Silicon Valley, you're successfully investing not only in Korea and in Japan, but in some Southeast Asian countries. How do you deal with the challenges of learning, say, local culture, local business practices, how to evaluate how successful an entrepreneur or their idea will be in that country? How do you do it? Yeah, it's um, a lot of trial and error. And one of the biggest pieces or lessons learned is, is touching on the prior point is that when we come to an investment decision and the answer is, well, we don't understand if this entrepreneur is going to be strong enough. It is likely because we don't have a deep enough cultural appreciation for the environment that she or he is operating in to really make a strong assessment of the entrepreneur itself. So in that regard, it's very, very important for us uh, even though I'm Korean American, I have a lot of familiarity with Korean culture itself. Uh, I would not rely on myself to fully assess a Korean entrepreneur's capabilities because I don't have enough cultural context often to make that call. The self-awareness around that is as important as the expertise because when you know that, then you can then go seek the expertise of those who do understand those cultural nuances that can help you make that call about an entrepreneur itself. You know, that's critically important because I think that it's so easy to think that the Silicon Valley model works everywhere as it is. And one reason we're doing these series of, of you know, seminars is so that we can see the diversity of ways of doing things and how this works. Uh, I want to jump back we had a kind of technical question about coupon and it has to do with when they registered as a US company, because I understand they did that sometime before they went public. So once they registered as a US company, did they have increased scrutiny from the Korean government? How did that affect their growth of the business in Korea? Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. Um... I think any kind of technical matters around where one is registered is probably very much correlated to the capital that one might be seeking to raise itself. And so um, uh, I think being registered in uh, Delaware or in Singapore or in other jurisdictions allows it or makes it easier for foreign investors to make investments into companies pursuing business models in other countries themselves that might not be in those, those jurisdictions themselves. And so I think it really comes down to where are you thinking about capital raising? Uh, maybe to extend that qu question a little bit, Professor Dasher, is yeah. why did Coupon decide to register on the New York Stock Exchange versus the Korea Stock Exchange uh, as an example? Uh, and I think that is where you get the highest density of investors that understand, could understand your, your business as well as possible being on the New York Stock Exchange. And so similarly, other corporate governance or other corporate matters about where you register or open your offices are probably following that same business rationale. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps in 20, 30 years, this is not an issue because harmonization of laws, opening of borders to foreign investment become you know, more standardized itself. But uh, my guess is that a lot of it had to do with how to best attract foreign capital itself. Okay, that makes good sense. Um, kind of, uh, we're moving into sort of a much more uncertain world these days. And I wonder if, uh, you see movements away from globalization that might make your position harder, might make it more difficult to do this kind of investing in diverse markets. 
especially, you know, in risk, you not only have business risk, you've got political risk. And, you know, things are kind of tight with COVID these days, too. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I mean, um, during the middle of COVID, we were uh, diligencing one of our first investments in when, when COVID kind of broke out more broadly um, in Southeast Asia and Vietnam itself. And it was a company called Momo. So it's one of the largest fintech platforms in Vietnam at this point millions of users on its platform. Um, but we were supposed to jump on a plane and get to Vietnam in March of 2020 itself. And so obviously th that never happened uh, itself because of uh, COVID and the travel restrictions. Um, and so uh, well, we, that, that I think in some ways highlighted the technical difficulties but it, it made us think even harder about how can we be a value add as a venture capital firm based in Silicon Valley to even a fintech uh, startup in Vietnam itself. And that I think is really, uh, there will be lots of obstacles, maybe they're political nature, they're regulatory in nature, they're, um, you know, people are becoming more nationalistic maybe over time or any of these uh, trends that you might see and, and things tend to go in waves and, and come and go and normalize, but there will always be something. I think the constant for us as a venture capital firm is always thinking about how do we add differentiated value? And I think that is why we have decided to always focus on just consumer technology itself and say, again, you could be um, an e-commerce provider in Turkey, in uh, South Korea, in Japan, in Southeast Asia, in LATAM, we have something to offer because this is the practice that we do. It's, it is our craft and we have uh, a lot of exp expertise around it itself. I think if we started to venture into other areas, it gets that much harder to really be able to say, you know, um, uh, we, we have a really differentiated value add to have. I'm not saying it's impossible, but our path is to double down on that differentiation so that in the, the, the face of, of changes, we can still say we have you know, a real differentiated value to add to companies uh, no matter where they're located itself. Okay. How, uh, how early are you investing in remote startups? Do you get in in the seed or mostly series A round? How yeah, do you we'll, get your information about the possible investments? Yeah, we'll, we'll go as early as seed um, itself. And um, those can be relatively small checks just to start relationships with companies and start providing value to them as well. And then um, given our, you know, the, 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 our emphasis on really helping to build companies and, and um, unlock their fullest potential over time, you know, we definitely double down and put uh, uh, capital at the early stages, series A and series B. And then we also have a growth fund so we can make even larger bets at the Series C and Series D stages as well. So we're really full stack, if you will. We can, uh, over the life of a company, and be investing tens of millions of dollars into a single company itself and uh, support them in their life cycle. Uh, and that is really rewarding to do. Um, but again, it hinges on this ability to have differentiated value add on the consumer tech vector itself. Okay. So um, when you first started out talking about Goodwater, I immediately started thinking, oh my gosh, he's doing impact investing. Yep. So, uh, which is, you know, it's really wonderful that you're looking for social good and that you want things that will change the world in a good way. Tell me what you think about the whole move toward impact investing and also ESG, where you're not only looking at the kind of, environmental impact and sustainability, but you're looking at quality of governance and diversity and so forth. How do you think that's changing venture capital? Yeah, you know, um, I, I think that it, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, there, there's, a, there's quite a debate now in, in the Valley itself. Uh, you see companies like uh, Coinbase or Basecamp put out there and say, hey, we're not going to talk about anything other than just work here. And we have a job to do. We're paid a salary. 
we get, we put input and there's output to be done. And uh, there'll be no talk about, you know, social justice causes or, or things like that. And, and uh, our products will speak for ourselves, so to speak. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, that, that is one line of, of thought itself. And it, it, I think uh, I'm, I'm not uh, just casting it off. I, I, I've, I personally have also started to think about it and just try to reflect like, why, why are folks uh, thinking about this or, or being so um, open about it? They, they have conviction about it. And I'm trying to understand why. At the same time, I really think that for people to feel whole, their professional self has to be their own personal self as well. The person they are when they leave the home and go into the workplace needs to also be the same person they are at home itself. It's incongruent and inconsistent for people to say, hey, I'm going to certainly suit up and I'm now going to be you know, a different person at work. And then I'm going to come home and be this other person. It, it, it seems incongruent. And, um, and in, in that regard, I think companies that are starting to think about, hey, how are we thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, how do we think about justice as well? How do we think about our role itself in the broader you know, economy or in the environment? Now, I don't espouse by any kind of like certain strict guidelines or, or, or elements like that. I think the, 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 the intentions of those uh, can be great. I, I don't have like a, a, a firm view, uh, Professor Dasher, uh, to be transparent on, on them. Mm -hmm. But I think if people have like an ethos or an intention that, hey, we want to be have a positive impact, we want to have strong values in what we do, actually the culture around those, I think will be even more impactful than any processes or kind of regulations or elements that people have. If people really believe it in their hearts, that's the yeah. most important element of change. And so I think that's something we look for. Obviously, having accountability standards is important. I think that the fact that it's being talked about more is great. Um, we're, how we approach things is through our value system and, and really emphasizing that in and of itself. Because if you change the trajectory of a company by even one degree in, their, in how they think about their impact on the world, it can be tremendous. These are companies that have impacted hundreds of millions of lives. Right. For better or for worse, right, presidential elections can be determined on certain social platforms. Right. And so yeah. are we going to just say, well, just maximize advertising profits for, the, for these companies? I think we would all agree that we, we need to get, have some careful consideration of the impact that these companies are having themselves. And that fact that people need to struggle with that, I think, is really an important part of the process. That's what we're looking for. We are not here to dictate a solution and say, this is right and this is wrong. We're here to enter that into the conversation and say, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about the impact here? How would we weigh carefully these different decisions itself? And so uh, I think that's additive to the conversation from where we are today. It's not sufficient, um, but it's additive at this point and why we, we feel conviction to keep moving on in that direction. Okay. You know, uh, we're a little bit early, but I think that this is a really good comment for us to close the formal part of the session and then continue in a more informal, off-the-record manner for a few more minutes if you can. So, Absolutely. Kimberly, we'll stop the recording now. First, everyone, thank you so much, Eric. That was a wonderful presentation. I learned a great deal about the venture capital world, as well as about the world of uh, consumer technology, as well as about the world in Korea. Thanks so much. We'll My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now. <laughs>